I'm the I'm a member of the Energen Institute, a co-director, and I'm Professor of Innovation and Development at the Open University. And it's a great pleasure this morning to introduce Theo Papayano and Smita Srinivas, who will be discussing their paper on the politics of innovation. So we're going to discuss that paper in the context of the COVID pandemic. What is it about their paper that tells us something, some insights about COVID? So let's, let's get started. I will start by introducing Smita Srinivas. Smita is a professorial fellow at the Open University in development and in economics. She also directs um, quite a, quite a long-term project called the Technological Change Lab, which is a global initiative. She is also the, uh, a, a multiple prize winner for her work on the relationship between health policy, production of health and consumption of health. So very, very important for the COVID pandemic. She's a winner of the Myrdal Prize um, for, for, for her book, Market Menagerie, famous book, Market Menagerie. And she's also very recently won the Clarence Ayres Prize uh, for her work on evolutionary economics. At the Open University, she works uh, on teaching, but mostly research, including on innovation in cancer care. So that's Smita. Welcome. Thank you. And also, and also Theo Papayano, who is the director of the Innogen Institute. He's a professor of politics. Now it's such a mouthful. Politics, innovation, and development at the Open University. He's also a member of the UK. Among other things, he's a member of the UK Innovation Caucus, which is a, a UK-based uh, uh, institution for looking at innovation issues and innovation policy within the UK. And he re recently wrote a book which is relevant to today called um, Inclusive, Inclusive Innovation for Development. Um, so if you want a longer, a longer read than you're, than you're going to hear this morning, you should read his book and Smita's book. So welcome, Theo. Thank you. I, <laughs> I thought I'd start us off by asking a simple question, which is that um, for the last 50 years, um, many academics have worked in the sphere of innovation and they've moved innovation from being something completely marginal in, in, in research and academe to a major interdisciplinary area of study uh, and also extremely important since it affects um, everyone in the way they live their lives, go to work and consume goods and products. So out of this 50 years of academic research, um, I wanted to ask you what you think you've done, which is different to that 50 years of, of scholarship. Because within that 50 years of scholarship, as I understand it, there has been a trenchant critique of neoliberal, of neoclassical um, policies towards innovation, that you just let things roll and hero innovators will come through and we'll all get the goods we need. Uh, so there's been a trenchant critique of that and a defense of the role of the state and other institutions to make innovation happen. So that's already on the table, as it were. So what is it about your work which goes beyond that, do you think? Maybe first, Shmita. So first of all, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with uh, Inogen, where I'm also associated, and Inogen is doing some pretty amazing work. Um, so if you are a fan of innovation work in any regard, you should be tracking Inogen. The second thing I want to say is it's also a pleasure to be uh, in discussion uh, with David Weald, who's uh, quite uh, an authority on a lot of work at the interface of engineering and innovation. So thank you, David. Um, what have we done uh, that critiques 50 years? Okay, we're, we're not starting with the simple questions. <laughs> um, I, I would um, put it in a couple of different ways. And of course, Theo will have his, his own take on this. One of the fundamental issues around innovation is that its relationship to development is highly contested. And 
one of the reasons it has been taken up in such huge measure in this paper um, and in our respective work is because the development debate about innovation is contested and unresolved. It is unresolved because the existing debates around uh, neoclassical economics, but also, as we point out in this paper, around Schumpeterian economics is unresolved. So even if you believe we have moved further away from the neoclassical critique, the Schumpeterian analysis of innovation and its modern day counterparts, what we call the neo-Schumpeterian schools, have not fully resolved what we think of some of the pressing issues. Um, the second piece, which is really the kind of development political economy debate, um, itself has developed in certain ways that perhaps not all are reconcilable with a Schumpeterian critique. So there are two or three layers of analysis here that have to be um, pulled apart. Um, and I think in this paper, we've taken a first step. Theo, yeah, what do you also think? Yes, well, let me also thank you for this uh, initiative. It's great pleasure to have this informal discussion with all of you. I think uh, um, I agree with Smita. Uh, so our starting point was the relationship between um, what has been done within innovation studies and its relationship to uh, development. And I think um, uh, our view has been that though these uh, 50 years, lots of work has been done around innovation uh, from a new sympathetic perspective. I think there are different camps uh, and, and theoretical views within the new Sympatarian approach that we try to highlight here. One is that uh, innovation is rather a smooth, cohesive uh, process that uh, uh, involves adaptation. Um, the other is that innovation is much more complex. There is lots of variety of approaches behind um, innovation and therefore uh, lots of these approaches are very value laden. So we try to uh, highlight that and um, take a position really. So that was um, the purpose of that paper. Um, not to say that um, innovation is just um, one, um, the new Sympathetarian approach to innovation is just one uh, school of thought, but to highlight the different uh, variations within and particularly those coming from the development perspective. And, and just to add to that, if I can, I mean, I think this question of how the development schools um, and the development body of work itself, which uh, by no means comes out of an uncontested terrain over the last 50 years, the dovetailing of these two approaches, which is innovation scholars, development scholars, and some subset in between, in some ways is well encapsulated in this article. Um, and I think you'll find that scholars from these different traditions will find something in this that they can hopefully engage with, uh, critique, uh, but it should move them a little bit forward on the questions of how to think about the value proposition of innovation, what does it mean, and what is the political economy broadly conceived which marries sort of the, the challenges of both the economics uh, discipline, the political science uh, discipline, as well as uh, kind of development studies as a group. Yes, so um, a lot of innovation policies um, have been promoted uh, over the years as um, sort of value neutral based entirely on, on evidence. And this is not only, of course, in the UK or in the US, it's uh, in other countries as well. I mean, if you think of examples like, for example, uh, back in the 80s, the Bay Doll Act and many other um, uh, policies um, have been informed by particular set of values, um, you know, including um, um, neoliberal values, of course. Um, this notion of scientists as, as entrepreneurs who have to commercialize, uh, to make uh, huge profits. Um, uh, I mean, behind that, um, there are value propositions. But um, within what we term cohesive systems of innovation in that paper. This is not so apparent. 
Whereas, of course, in more fragmented systems where there are conflicts of, of values, and this is, I think, much more apparent. So we, we say a little bit um, uh, about that in the paper, and I think that's also quite relevant for the discussion later about COVID. I thought that was very important in my reading of the paper. Um, it made me self-critique, I think, my own. Um, some of my material can easily be critiqued as being quite technocratic, um, quite cohesive, really. Um, and it struck me in reading your paper how right you were about the fact that although there are people in this area who think about green policies, for example, um, um, very important, uh, the people who think about pro-poor and more inclusive work and have and have done since the beginning of innovation studies, but that sometimes seems like it's on the periphery of the of the discipline and that the more cohesive seems to be a bit more central. Uh, I, mean, I wondered if, if you had anything, any, any small things to say about that before we moved on to COVID. I would add a few examples here because I think audience listening to something like this, this is always helpful to reveal some of the challenges of the kind of work we do. Um, so Dave, you're absolutely right. We would all look at our own work, right? We come from certain traditions where we work uh, interested in issues of inequality or inclusion. We are concerns with, concerned with different manifestations of the distribution of certain kinds of products, uh, COVID, vaccines versus diagnostic kits, all of these are in the news, so now everyone is thinking about them. But the challenge here is that in a way these traditions have developed of analysis within, if not full disciplinary silos, certainly methodo methodological silos. So it ends up being that the kind of evidence one looks for or the, the way in which you collaborate remains quite structured. Uh, it becomes a bit of a prison. And I think one of the exciting things about this collaboration, and a shout out to my dear colleague Theo here, is that over the years, Theo and I have discovered that we are both highly contentious, we have a lot of disagreement, but we're able to nevertheless move forward, which I think is really quite exciting uh, for scholarship. Um, and our different disciplines have both struggled with this uh, issue. So um, what Theo, uh, for instance, uh, is interested in about, say, justice would be framed quite differently in some of the work I do. But let me give you like two or three simple examples of the labels that some of our audience might be thinking about. In our paper, we kind of tease out a little bit of the challenge the bottom of the pyramid approach, uh, the scarcity induced innovation approach, the uh, Grameen Bank kind of idea, uh, the notion that you might have frugal innovation, you might have appropriate tech. These are all ways of getting to the same uh, broad goals, but the process assumptions and value propositions and the kind of theories and methods they draw on are actually very different. So, we provide in the paper a couple of examples about how there's a way to make it more precise, there's a way to be more overt, and without self-censorship, there's a way in which to kind of move one's work forward, which I think is constructive. Yes, um, I couldn't agree more uh, on that. And I think um, our uh, disciplinary background have uh, contributed um, to, this, to this perspective. Uh, uh, my background, which is politics, um, tends to um, uh, direct me to think about policy a little bit differently um, than um, in some of the writings within um, the broad uh, new cemetarian approach to innovation, um, because I, I tend to think of, of policy not as um, something independent of, of, of politics. And when you bring in politics, of course, you bring in uh, values and you also bring in the different uh, conflicts of values and interests which always play their role in determining which policy will go forward and which policy will will not go forward and I think um, that's quite uh, important to uh, say here and um, 
if you if you take examples of of policies um even within um the situation that we are in um you know um a new investment in in artificial intelligence uh development of of uh you know uh vaccines, the redeployment of 3D printing for dealing with problems um, uh, of COVID. I mean, behind that, there are um, some particular value thinking, uh, which is uh, basically about developing those technologies um, uh, within within the market. What hasn't been happening for so many years um, somehow needs to happen now. Now, this is a particular political perspective that affects uh, policy choices, and I think the paper that um, we wrote gives a good basis to think through that. OK, so maybe we should move on to thinking about COVID then. If uh, you've given us a good opportunity to start <laughs> thinking about COVID, what kind of insights do you think your work um, can can give to the, co to, the, to the situation around COVID? which is a you know which is a huge which is, it wasn't exactly that people did not know there was going to be a pandemic but here it is uh, so finally there's an opportunity to look at a serious crisis which which can only be analyzed i guess in 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 the kind of way you're advocating so um I, i'm really interested in what you say on that i don't know who wants to go first theo do you want to go first so I think um, our paper, um, as I said, provides a good basis to think about uh, policies within uh, within COVID. Um, so on the one hand, um, you've got policies driven uh, mainly by the political belief on, on, on the market and the opportunities that firms can uh, see in developing health technologies and the expectation that firms will somehow adapt in the new uh, situation. On the other hand, um, this um, has led to some kind of fragmentation as regards production of essential uh, equipment, um, you know, whether PPE or ensuring uh, oxygen in, in uh, oxygen supplies in, in hospital. It's been um, really difficult to um, uh, deal with many years of uh, public and private underinvestment in health innovation and infrastructure and I think that paper can explain more or less why this has has been done, what kind of values probably were behind that, especially thinking about this um, uh, dualism between the, the, the cohesive systems and, and, and the fragmented uh, systems that that we mentioned. Um, uh, so, I mean, in a, in a in a crisis like COVID-19, of course, innovation policy should not be um, just focusing on um, uh, emerging technologies, uh, uh, rather innovation policies should be driven um, uh, by more uh, the politics of, of justice and have uh, some kind of, of different perspective, um, I think, when it comes to dealing with emergency at, uh, as, as such, and therefore strengthening capacity uh, in health systems as, as a whole, I think, uh, is a perspective that uh, I could defend on the basis of the argument that we put in that paper. But but Smita can mention more, um, you know, uh, specific examples there. I mean, I, I, I think the point that Theo has just made, which is that in a way, it's been very tempting, both in development studies as well as economics, certainly in economics, to assume that values are these kind of free floating ideas out there that we should politically, uh, uh, you know, um, a vow to defend, but practically we don't have a way forward. And in a way, what we're doing in this paper is providing some tools and techniques and perspective on exactly how you might do this, calling on and differentiating between different subschools of the neo -Shimpetarians. Now. One of the things that I think is slightly provocative about our paper, and I would encourage people to go in and kind of engage with that provocation, is we actually name authors and fairly um, um, categorically put them in a table. And if you were one of those people, I'm sure this is an excellent opportunity for you to say, hey, why am I in, in row five and column two? But I think this is exactly the point. 
when we assess a scholar's work, we are implicitly deciding how he or she has engaged with a particular topic over time. We provide the example, quite different from COVID, but directly relevant, of labor standards. So there are a lot of scholars who are in principle for better labor standards, but there are only a subset of labor scholars who study, say, shoe uh, manufacture or innovation or say toxicity of innovations in glue or shoe bindings or the sole of shoes or the manufacturer who would explicitly address the question of well-being of workers. Now, in that context, something as precise, should toxic glue even be allowed to be manufactured is a question a lot of innovation scholars, maybe not development scholars, but innovation scholars would would argue much more broadly. They would not address the specifics. And the opportunity here is to combine the specifics and differentiate the kind of scholarship out there that would allow us to get to the, the value propositions in point. So labor standards then becomes kind of the umbrella and there's a way to differentiate between different kinds of propositions about innovation. So coming to COVID, um, I think there's some issues here. One Theo has pointed out, which is that there is a kind of, and you pointed out, Dave, that is there's a, a market versus state idea for quite a long time. But it has not helped us answer some of the practical questions, even if you presume that some kind of relationship between the two and overlapping spheres of engagement exist, what should people do? And our hope is to kind of combine big P policy with both theory methods, but also little p in terms of kind of planning, public administration, all the rest that would actually get us somewhere. In COVID, one big debate, for example, has been in the absence of a vaccine, what should we do with respect to masks, testing, lockdown, and a range of other non-technologically driven processes, right? So there are many aspects to this that don't just cover um, innovation in the narrow sense, uh, the product or, or, or uh, process innovation sense. But the other ideological question facing us today, which I think is, is also important and the paper provides a way forward, is if there are, um, in some of our research, uh, just a, a point on this, in COVID testing kits, we're finding that countries have responded very differently to this practical issue. And there are many ways in which embedded as they are in their systems, their local manufacturing priorities, the range of organizations that have helped them provide COVID testing kits and their rollout have been quite different. The empirical issue facing us is if we had to squeeze that institutional variety, something I am very keen on discussing in my own work, back into the framework of innovation, we would struggle. So the paper provides us a way forward and says, assuming institutional variety, assume huge organizational variety, assume the development landscape is much wider than you think it is, how would you resolve differences between the neo schumpeterians Yes, that's right. And it also enables to think um, more specifically about uh, what you just mentioned, the local manufacturing, for example, based on this institutional variety that doesn't really follow one um, particular part. You know, um, the local manufacturing is emerging as a critical component of, um, um, you know, to, ad to address uh, so of uh, medical devices uh, related this been in shortage for for so long but as you say the, the the institutional variety behind that that enables such thing to happen in some countries and not to happen in some other uh, countries i think um, it's quite important and i think uh, our paper can provide some insights uh, there um, so one can think through the the, the layers of, of institutions and also the impact of those institutions on um, the process of innovation uh, locally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and maybe this is going a bit beyond the paper, but 
Um, one thing um, that both of you have worked on, I know, is this, this, this lack of synchronization between health policy and health systems and the industrial systems. And the COVID seems to have laid that bare. Uh, and as, as you say, um, one approach is, is a, a kind of more centralized, we can do this and crack it. But actually, um, don't you think that what has actually happened in each different local context, a whole set of engaged people have come through with a set of potential solutions. So in a way, it, in a way your thesis is, is shown to be working in the, well, at least it's operating in the context of COVID to try and deal with this extremely uncertain and, and dangerous situation. What, one comment I might like to make is I think the, the it has been tempting, I think, for science um, and engineering, uh, the natural sciences and engineering, situated as they are in a particular set of value propositions about the role of uh, technical knowledge and its either open-ended inquiry about what it's for in the case of what people would call basic science or this kind of hybrid of a, applied work or the commercializable ambit that there hasn't in a way been a a response around values and innovation that would articulate how science and technology in its broad sense can be quote useful to development. Um, there's a very long history as we all know on this and a very rich debate about this for the last in many countries um, I'm in India you know good 70 years of this debate. The challenge has been that the norms and values by which scientists and certain kinds of engineers see themselves as broadly governed by is increasingly global norms of how the institutions of science or engineering to some degree, but mostly science, uh, could, should, might behave. And the, the norms of the more contentious values by which they deal with issues in COVID, such as local health evidence, questions of population demographics, issues such as clinical translation and feedback. These are things that have become highly contentious, even in the places where local manufacturing might function. So one of the, um, if you like the opportunities of the paper, and I think Theo and I have plenty to think about, about version two of something like this, is how to reconcile not just fragmented systems at the level of nations and nation states, but to think about these siloed institutions that may have global uh, uh, kind of ethics and epistemology by which they function, but which are in very local contexts. One difficulty that arises is, for example, a kind of a, a friction between local health, global health kind of perspectives, uh, and there may be other. Some of the old ones we're more familiar with is, of course, multinationals, local companies, all of that. That's a more familiar debate. But these are some of the, the frictions. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I would, I would add basically that um, we, we, we realize this, this frictions take, take place, um, you know, um, not just uh, locally and globally, of course, you know, I mean, you have the friction between health systems and industrial systems. What, what kind of values do you need to have behind in order to manage to bring these things um, uh, together? Because I mean, COVID-19 is, is demonstrating that actually this, this um, huge gap it's not only the case in, in developing countries, it's also in, in developed countries, right? Because you have lots of different, you know, for a number of years, don't enable proper interaction and functioning um, of those two. The same happens with um, the global and, and, and the local. I think uh, at least we might start thinking about what kind of value framework we need to have as a basis to achieve that kind of synergy in the in the future and, and probably that's an idea for another paper i think just uh, <laughs> taking from um you know 
taking some lessons from what has been happening in innovation policy, uh, you know, uh, during the COVID time. Can I add one point here? I think the Theo's um, point about these frictions that they might manifest in different ways, health policy, industrial policy is a case in point. Not all of them are resolvable in the common way people think of either political economy or politics. Um, the elections are on in multiple countries, and of course we imagine all of these can be reconciled in either electoral or something else. But one of the reasons to focus on value uh, propositions and making them explicit in our work is that you may have multiple ways in which to resolve this, and it doesn't all have to be uh, dealt with somehow in uh, your voting behavior. And th this is quite important because that body of work can make it sound as if the only way we have is by um, dealing with national level politics. But industry associations, for instance, um, community groups, uh, large that have built out in different, often uh, competing uh, organizations in ordinary times, show us that there are other ways of reconciling the long goal with very different intermediate processes. Uh, two or three examples might be around procurement and logistics, uh, vendors who might need to signal in new ways that their product or service is important. Uh, we also have very specific examples of this institutional variety when you think of um, studying local manufacturing or local services competence without assuming uh, a national convergence around patterns. So in the big countries, whether it's a Brazil or India or the US and so on, these can be quite pronounced regional differences and they cannot all be easily captured in one innovation policy, quote unquote. And this is important. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So I just wanted to say that um, what, what Smita says basically uh, very much deals with the issue that we also raised in that paper, which is the issue of uncertainty. Now, the supertarians have had a particular take of this notion of, of uncertainty, and they've done a great job uh, trying to uh, unpack what uncertainty, uncertainty means. But that's very much within um, the broad notion of, um, of the market as an institution that somehow um, enables uh, firms and, and individuals to adapt. Um, beyond that, there is the issue of, of reconciliation that Smith mentioned that is quite important um, dealing with uncertainty. And that's also something that, you know, I mean, if, if you try to unpack it, there is lots of politics behind this reconciliation, this 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 convergence, which I think um, some new sympathetarians tend to miss. Uh, but as I say, you know, that's another point that we try to make uh, in the paper, uh, talking about uncertainty and what we think that, um, you know, um, we should be doing, you know, in, in order to deal with the problem of uncertainty in, in, in the market and institutions. OK, I've got one final question, I think, which is that um, um, this is a very important paper, this paper in innovation and development. Um, we hope everyone will read it, but I, I, I think I'm sensing that you're going to continue to work. Um, um, I just wondered what, very briefly, what your thoughts are on where you go from here. Will you try and do something around COVID or, or what are you thinking of for your plans in the future? Not too long in the future. <laughs> Theo, you go first. Well, I think that um, um, the situation with COVID uh, enables us to think more specifically uh, about uh, uh, values and about uh, innovation. I think we can uh, draw on um, uh, case studies uh, around COVID basically to substantiate some of the theoretical claims that we make in that paper, because that paper is predominantly uh, theoretical and we can actually uh, draw on uh, empirics around COVID. Um, uh, Smita and uh, you actually are involved in a great uh, uh, empirical work around COVID and engineering. Uh, I'm involved um, in some of the um, uh, thinking around uh, 
innovation diffusion around uh, vaccines for COVID, etc. So I think uh, it gives us a good opportunity to think more specifically of some, uh, you know, of the claims that we make in that paper. Um, I would just add to say that, you know, Theo and I, when we work together, are surprisingly um, agreed um, as people who write on theory that the basis for theory building goes very uh, sort of strongly back and forth and quickly back and forth between the evidence and the theory. And in a way, what is exciting about the collaboration has been that we are both, health is certainly a domain and COVID, Theo is right, will be the quite, quite strong um, sort of a, a way to proceed. But I also think that the best parts of a collaboration are, take, take our last round of responses to you, Dave. Theo mentions uncertainty and the Schumpeterians, and I mentioned electoral politics. I thought we were going to switch these roles. So there's a, there's a great chance, <laughs> there's a great chance for us to, um, to think critically and remember in our own disciplines, the definitions are quite different of these phenomena. The methodologies are different. So we are both uh, contributing in our own um, training areas, but we are also trying to push forward um, some shared domains. I think COVID, um, there's, there's a big body of work on COVID that's proceeding. All of us are involved. <clears throat> and also um, a bit of a shout out for Inogen, because I think some of the exciting work on regulation um, and regulatory policy has been done, I think, with much greater precision at Inogen than most other places who are still talking about this domain of work in in much broader non-specific terms and I think Inogen, um, Inogen's body of work is quite important. Um, just to end on this, I think uh, for anyone listening who comes from, who is interested in tech policy, industrial policy, innovation policy, you're interested in science policy, um, people who are interested in economic or these multiple disciplines uh, feeding into these domains. We would love to hear from you and really think of a way in which you can critically engage. We uh, kind of go bravely into this domain and we would love to get critique back and hear a little bit more um, of how we can build further. Um, our work both speaks to policy and um, certainly looking forward to much more of that. Brilliant, thank you so much. So I think um, we are hoping that we will get a lot of feedback, all ideas welcome. Uh, it does feel like the work will continue. So I just wanted to thank Smita Srinivas and Theo Papayano and also our community, the Inogen community communications officer who without her nothing happens, uh, Monica or horse flight. So thank you to her as well and I hope to hear from you soon. Thank you. Thank you thank very you much. All.